Hello, I'm Jeff, Executive Vice President here at Amoco Brent. Over 100 years ago, my grandfather founded Amoco. Today, my brother and I carry on his legacy. Our team works diligently to bring you the best clays, glazes, equipment, and more for your studio and a classroom. This week's episode is brought to you by Amoco Brent. Please find your favorite Amoco or Brent product at your local distributor today. Thank you for choosing Amoco for all your clay and glaze needs. Today's episode is brought to you by the Rosenfeld Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. The collection exists as an online resource for research and inspiration featuring photos of thousands of objects made by over 800 artists. The images are high quality and can be used with no permission required, making them a great resource for students and teachers. To find out more, visit rosenfieldcollection.com. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 458 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. This episode's coming out a little bit early this week because I'm getting ready to go to Enseca. And today's episode is about sustainability, and it actually features members of the Enseca Green Task Force. Today I'll be talking to Robert Harrison and Danielle O'Malley about the history and goals of the task force. The group works to educate and empower artists to engage in sustainability and environmental stewardship. If you're interested in finding out more, the GTF will have a booth at this year's conference in Cincinnati, and you can also visit their website, which is insecagtf.com. You might have noticed that we're having a mini-series on sustainability, and the third and final episode will be a live taping That's going to be happening Friday, March the 17th at 2.30 in room 212, and it features Marianne Chenard and Green Task Force members Julia Galloway and Che Ochley. If you're interested in sustainability, this is a good time to meet folks that are also interested in the same, and you'll be able to ask that panel questions about the work that they do both with the task force and the art that they make in their creative practice. If you'd like more information, you can go to Enseca.net, or you can download their app, which has a complete schedule. It's a a great revamp of their app, so it it can really help your conference experience. You can find that at the App Store or wherever you get apps on your smartphone. Before we get to today's interview, I wanted to thank the folks that donate to our show. We are listener-supported, so I'd like to thank Bill Moore, Deborah Robert, and Joy Chadrick for their recent contributions. If you're interested in becoming a member of the Red Clay Rambler community, you can join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash redclayrambler. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. So let's start with having you all introduce yourselves and then what your connection to the Green Task Force is. My name is Robert Harrison. I live in Helena, Montana. I'm a studio artist uh, that also does uh, large-scale outdoor work and installations. I have been associated with NSICA, uh, I'm guessing, probably three decades altogether, been to... uh, many, many, many conferences. I love the organization and the people. I was, I got on the board uh, in the early 1990s as uh, director at large, went on to, uh, was asked to become publications director, which I did. And then after that, at some point, I was asked to uh, 
uh, become the, the president of Enseca. And I was president from uh, uh, 2004 to 2010. The uh, Green Task Force uh, was uh, was had been discussed not not necessarily that name, but the whole issue of uh, sustainability and greening of the organization uh, had been discussed in board meetings for a while. And finally, towards the end of my presidential term, uh, the decision was made to make it official and create the de Green Task Force and. Uh, we just got started, you know, sort of it was an outgrowth of the internal conversations that the board was having, uh, thinking about sustainability. Uh, and then it, it evolved into more than that, where the Green Task Force actually has its own sort of uh, uh, set of principles that it, it abides by. And uh, with with education being the really the uh, probably the most important aspect of what we do. So Danielle, do you uh, want to introduce yourself? My name's Danielle O'Malley, and I've been involved with the Green Task Force for about a year and a half. Um, I joined not long after receiving my MFA from UMass Dartmouth. Um, yeah, and I've been trying to help out with communications within the task force. So volunteer outreach and kind of promoting the organization to... Um, help us as a whole, like promote environmental awareness and sustainability within our field. Yeah. And one of the reasons we're talking today is, is that there's the, the task force always is involved with the NSICA conference itself. And usually there's a table, there's um, sometimes there's panel discussions or green task force members or uh, giving lectures or different things like that. And um, what we're trying to do here is to get some energy around the task force itself. So, Robert, can you talk about what the goals were when you all originally started the task force in 2008 and then how those have shifted up to 2022? Well, the Green Task Force, as I mentioned uh, previously, was, was an outgrowth of, of conversations that the board was, was having in the early 2000s. And um, the, the idea was that we would promote uh, through, uh, you know, things online and, and at the conference, we would promote uh, important issues in sustainability for the membership about how potters, sculptors, ceramic artists, uh, you know, work towards having a sustainable studio and, and a sustainable practice. And uh, the, the Green Task Force was tagged with identifying others in the field that may be good examples of that stewardship of uh, promoting, as you said, Ben, um, talks or, or lectures at the conference, and then eventually having a booth, an actual presence uh, at the conference. And we've been doing that steadily. I think this year, 2023 in Cincinnati will be our biggest presence uh, at the conference in terms of the booth and the kinds of activities we're going to have and demonstrations going on there. Yeah, I was, I was looking through the mission statement or the um, strategic plan for the task force, which is all available online if, if folks want to check it out. And one of the things that was talked about is, is that you want to establish or the task force wants to establish best practices for um, having a green studio. So establishing them is, is one task and then disseminating or educating the public or at least in SICA members about the best practices is is kind of the second part of that. And there's actually a bunch of other things that are a part of it. But I wanted to talk about this idea of best practices, like how you can establish best practices from an environmental perspective in your own home studio. So how has the task force gone about collecting that information? And then how have you guys disseminated it? We have monthly meetings where we discuss all of these topics. Um, so recently we even had like Nancy Selvage come and give a presentation to the force. And it was talking about like carbon, um, carbon footprint and emissions, including like at one point she was talking about like wood firing and like the CO2 that's like put off by that. Um, other things that we do is so this summer we had like a little like Zoom gathering where we met for like three or four hours 
And we just like brainstormed and came up with like all these ideas and things that we wanted to research. And then from there, we broke off into groups where we could like tag team within smaller groups and start diving into like researching topics such as like recycling and different things you can do in your home studio. Like how do you re how do you reuse like the reclaim glaze and different things like that? Um, so yeah, we've been kind of tackling this all as like one big unit. And then we come together in these meetings, share our progress. And from there, you can see like on our website that there's a bunch of different resources that pertain to these things that we've been researching and looking into. And I'll, I'll tag on to that, Danielle. Uh, I want to mention the uh, EnsicaGTF.com website address for the website. I also want to mention the fact that it's actually an international group of people that come together. We have uh, Green Task Force members uh, in Europe and other parts of the world that plug into our meetings. And then we also have a, uh, a group of volunteers that uh, usually meet after our monthly meeting as a, a, a task force. We have the uh, meeting of the volunteers and we talk about opportunities to help the organization, help the task force out and, uh, and participate. Yeah, and, and what I'm hearing is that it's really a multi-pronged process that a lot of people are involved with. And it was nice to go to the website, and, and there's little bios on all the different people that are involved. And um, I, I know firsthand that you know some of the European it, – it's very interesting to try to organize a meeting when some of the folks are in Europe and some are in South America <laughs> and <laughs> so, sure. some are in the States. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, we just kind of have like a consistent time that we all meet. So um, for us out here in Montana, I think it's like 8 8 a.m. the third Friday of every month. So everyone just kind of has it on their calendars. And then um, Shonda also set it up in Google calendars so that we just have like a friendly reminder go off to help us all keep on track. Um, So I think that kind of helps to coordinate everyone. even across the globe. It's like 7 p.m. Uh, Europe, European time or somewhere in that range. Uh, but everyone, uh, you know, that, that wants to participate is uh, is welcome. And uh, it's quite a large group at this point. It's about 15 members uh, that meet regularly. And uh, everyone has, you know, terrific ideas and everyone contributes. Do you guys notice that there is a big difference in terms of environmental issues between countries? So, for instance, I'm thinking like, I don't know if you have any Brazilian members, but the folks in Brazil, their environmental issues are different than the U.S., which is different than, say, France. But do you guys notice that and talk about that in the task force? We do. We we notice the difference. Uh, some areas of the world are more uh, progressive, if, if you want to call it that, uh, towards the whole notion of, of sustainability and uh, trying to help the, the planet uh, endure. And others are a little less so, but but uh, there are different issues uh, in different countries. And the great thing is we may not be aware of some of the other issues, but they're brought to the table and we learn about them. And we all uh, certainly want to help each other with those issues. I think about that there are, are- sort of multiple parts of your average potter or sculptor's practice that can either be pretty environmentally friendly or not, depending on their uh, sort of orientation to how they work. And one of those is firing. And, you know, one of the most basic things that I was taught when I was in school is that you fire full kilns, you know, so that you're, you're, you're efficient in your use of firing which I think that is true, and I believe in that. But then there's also something to be said for how your kilns, whether they're gas or electric, hook up to major energy supplies. So like your electrical company, if there are a coal-powered coal uh, <laughs> coal-fired power plant, sorry, I can't get those words out today, <laughs> um, then that is a different environmental impact than if it's a hydroelectric power system. So... Exactly. <laughs> Can you guys talk a little bit more about that in your own lives, like using yourselves as an example, how you think about firing and efficiency? So I think like most recent examples, so Robert and I um, 
have been collaborating over the last year on a large scale installation. And we made the deliberate choice to like use not just locally sourced materials, but to also use like clay that's self-hardening. Um, so a type of Adobe clay where we don't have to fire at all. Um, so that's one way that we as a team have been dealing with that issue. Yeah, I think, uh, Ben, I would just say that your point is well taken. And it's an area in terms of knowing the source of your electricity. You know, the big push right now is for electrical power, for everything to be powered by electricity. But what uh, not so many people really comprehend or understand is that if your energy is coming from a, a dirty fuel fired power plant, uh, meaning oil uh, of some kind or coal, uh, that's not so great. It, it's the uh, hydroelectric power that's the cleanest or solar or wind or whatever. And I think we're making strides in, in those areas. Uh, I, I'm, I've recently been pushing to get information uh, about solar, using solar energy to fire electric kilns and, and other things for the studio potter. And I think that's a, a, a really important bit of information. It's, it's evolving. It's really just starting, but people are doing it. And uh, I think the task force will be gathering information along those lines and passing that along to, to the world uh, as, as it comes in, hopefully in the not too distant future. Yeah, and I think awareness is so much a part of this. So one of the things that people can do is find out where does their electricity come from? Because to be honest with you, I, I, until relatively recently, didn't know. I just thought electric is electric, and when I plug something in, it works. <laughs> so I never really thought about where does it come from. That's exactly right. And, uh, and you know, I've, I've learned, too, over the last few years, about about those sorts of things and uh you know it's it's an important thing to know and there's there's your uh, footprint you know the uh the footprint that we all make on this earth with the type of energies we use and how we use it um it, it's uh, where the task force is uh working on that as well to make sure everyone easily understands uh those sorts of things i will point out i will take a minute to point out that the book I wrote, Sustainable Ceramics, which I think is still available on Amazon, is uh, has a lot of that information in it for anyone who wants to, to look that up. There, there's not, not enough information out there, and we're trying to be a, a, a catalyst for, for spreading, that, spreading the word on all sorts of issues. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up the book because this is this is kind of a topic that I want to talk about is that let's say you have a question, a research question, like I want to make my studio more efficient and have less of a carbon footprint. From that essential question, what when you were writing the book and even before before the book, how did you go about researching? Like what resources did you turn to to figure out what was the best way to handle that question or solve it in your own life? Yeah, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, I wrote, you know, it's, the book was published in 2013. So it's 10 years old this year. And there's really not that many more, if any, publications specifically geared towards ceramics. But uh, I spent six months uh, researching, you know, looking, uh, turning over stones, looking everywhere I could for either information or people that had the information and speaking to them and you know it was an extensive uh, project probably larger than i than i thought initially uh but i did the, you know the best i can i could at the time with the resources i had a lot has changed in terms of of getting that information out there and i think there's a lot more places to look but it's one of the things that i think the green task force uh is promoting is is us being a resource so when someone does have a question about how do i calculate my carbon footprint or any of those things they can come to us they can uh, contact us and come to us and we can answer it and get back to them or publish it you know online or in the larger uh, uh, get the word out to the larger community i just wanted to yeah kind of reiterate that 
I think that is like turning into like a really big goal that we're focusing on as a, as the green task force is creating like, um, just becoming like a hub of resources that people can turn to and support their research questions and studio practices and everything. I've been listening to this um, history book about the Silk Road and energy policy. They talk about a lot of different things, but one of the things they talk about is energy policy and how, you know, for years and even now, you know, if we're getting gas or oil, a lot of times it is from the Middle East or other sources around the world. And I I just kind of want to break down the parts of this. So you have your energy source, which is if it's a fossil fuel, once you use that, it's it's burned up and there are um, environmental impacts that come from that. But also there is the literal shipping of the energy source to wherever you are. And as I'm reading this book, it just seems so nonsensical to think that we would get oil from halfway across the world, put it on a tanker truck, or sorry, a tanker um, boat, and then ship it use energy to ship that energy to us. So I think one of the most practical ways to think about environmental um, improvements is just use local materials, use local energy sources, and do what you can to kind of keep it all as close to you as possible. But that's that's easier said than done. So do you guys have any sort of insight or tips for how people can actually do that? Well, I think you're exactly right to point that out, Ben. Uh, one of our members, Nicole Ham, did a, a major research project on ceramic materials and where they come from specifically. And some of them are shipped not only once, but twice. There, There's a, a material uh, that goes from the, the U.S. eastern seaboard all the way to either Finland or uh, somewhere in, in Scandinavia by ship and to be refined. And then it comes back to North America and, <laughs> and gets used. And, you know, all this, uh, keeping it local is a huge thing and trying to figure out how can I locally, uh, how can I get locally available material that will, that will make my studio practice more sustainable. And, it, it, you know, I'm of the age where, I, I grew uh, up and, and learned, I was in art school in the 70s, and there was a big back to the land movement at that point where people were doing that, where they were going and digging clay from their local uh, river bed or or what have you and, and learning how to use it. And that's come full circle and, and people are doing that sort of thing again. But it's not only that, it's it's clay supply companies that are also doing that. They're getting turned on to uh, keeping things local. And I know the Bray here in in Helena, Montana, the Archie Bray Foundation is also investigating and looking into how can they be greener by, uh, you know, finding materials that are are really close at hand and turning on the the local and, and regional group of potters to these local locally available materials. So it's it's a really important and big topic of uh you know where do your materials come from and and what's involved in in getting them to you can you mention that person's name that did that research project again Cole ham and it we've published it i mean uh, the green task force has published it uh online uh it, it's it, i can't uh, it's somewhere there in our in our on our website i know that i think it's under the materials section yeah, clay material water. So uh, I think there's, uh, Julia's done a great job of getting this website all together. But, uh, uh, you know, there's quite a few articles there that people can uh, plug into. And, uh, you know, I hope we'll find helpful the wild, the whole wild clay movement that's, that's happening. And, and, you know, Josh DeWeese and and, uh, MSU, uh, ceramics department in Bozeman are, have done a big push. It's a, it's a part of their curriculum now is wild clay. And uh, I think other schools are, are also looking at that or other, and, and studios and so on. I think also like um, part of it, like, so raising awareness and like researching, like, um, so a lot of people work in porcelain and, you know, that could be shipped to like all the way from England. 
So from England to Montana, for example, that's a huge footprint right there. So what are, what are substitutes that you can use to like get that quality um, that you desire from a clay that might be like, how do you, how do you shorten that distance? Um, How do you become more local? So just kind of being aware of your materials and there's also a place called like Starworks too, where they really focus on entirely like locally sourced, like dug clay. Um, and they're like a resource to like go and buy that for like people. And um, are they in North Carolina? They are. Yep. Star North Carolina. They're a great place to kind of look at for that sort of model as well. I'm so glad you brought them up because um, Takaro Shibata and his wife and another uh, gentleman just published a book on wild clay. So exactly. it's, yeah, taking their research into this and, and putting it into written form. Um, and they're also a great example of if you do the research, you can really take a, because I think what keeps people from using local clay, or I should just speak for myself, often what's kept me from using it is the fear of the research. But in their book, like they go through, how do, how do you actually do it? You know, how do you prepare the clay samples so that you can figure out what you need to to then use the local material. So it's a really great resource. I agree. And uh, I'll, I'll just put in a plug for that book. Of course, I have a copy. I got it as soon as it came out. But everyone should really, from studio potters or individual artists to all, all studios and educational uh, programs should have a copy of that book and should be you know, sharing the, sharing the information there because it's great stuff. Sharing resources with people in your local area too is another way to, to help each other. Yeah. Talk more about that. Yeah. Like I've been thinking about it, especially recently, um, like kiln shares, like, uh, we just recently had a Montana clay, um, gathering, which is all the clay artists within our state. And one of the breakout sessions that we had was like literally like a kiln share situation where everyone exchanged material, like information and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, that can lead to like fuller kilns. It can lead to um, helping like divide costs amongst multiple multiple people. Um, And one thing that I think Robert mentions in his book, Sustainable Ceramics, that I've always really responded to is that finances and sustainability are often tied together. So I think that's a really great way to approach that. Or even recently, like Robert purchased a um a cardboard shredder for use turning um cardboard used cardboard into packing material and eliminating plastic. And you know, how can that be used within like the local community to kind of support like lowering our carbon footprint as a whole? So there's things like that, or even um I was talking to someone recently, like we all have art supplies in the back of our closet that we just don't use. And then they go old. Um, and sometimes that leads to, they need to be tossed out. So what if there's like, um, a local art supply resource share, like, Hey, you need this. I have it. I don't use it. So here you go. Um, so little things like that can also contribute to like lowering just our carbon footprint. Um, and also reduce our waste as a whole. I I agree, Danielle. I think that's uh, an area that we we need to do a better job with. And thanks for mentioning the cardboard shredder. Uh, you know, our our field is so multifaceted. I mean, because as as individuals, uh, we we do all, all of the activities involved, uh, making, but packing, shipping. Uh, you know, keep uh, trying trying to be smart uh, in terms of sustainability with every aspect of that and some of this uh, some of this these pieces of equipment really are are you know they're they're costly they're they're expensive and uh, they could easily be shared so that that sh- cardboard shredder that Danielle mentioned uh, I'm bringing mine to to the conference and uh, as a demo uh, piece for for the Insica Green Task Force booth, and uh, the idea is to uh, turn people onto it and get people to stop using plastic as much as possible because it's you know it's one of the besides air pollution. I mean, plastics work their way into everything as we most of us know now. 
uh, and the microplastics are in everything and we're ingesting them on a, on, sometimes on a daily basis. So uh, the, the more people that can get away from plastic use, the better. And, and we, just, we just need to share all that information and, and be, be really smart and together about it. I'm so glad you brought up the the cardboard shredder. I've I've been looking at those myself, and I'm kind of <laughs> I've got mm-hmm. my eye out for a used one because some of them can be quite expensive. Um, yeah. But as soon as it becomes a communal tool, then all of a sudden the cost can be shared. And I think this goes back to what Danielle was saying earlier: is that a lot of these environmental practices are just common sense. Like if you can get s- recycled cardboard boxes to now be your packing supplies, then you don't have to buy them, and that's going to save. If especially if you're a potter shipping out pots regularly to galleries, you're going to save a ton of money just by recycling. Exactly. You know, Tara Wilson, well-known uh, wood fire potter here in Helena, bought one of these machines, the same model I have, uh, make and model. And uh, she, two years ago, she bought it during the pandemic. She absolutely swears by it now. And does so she's going to be at the conference in Cincinnati. And uh, I've asked her to come by the booth at least once a day and, uh, you know, speak, we'll, we'll publicize it and uh, people can come by and talk to her directly about how she uses it and and uh, the value in that purchase. But uh, but communal is the way to go uh, with those machines. They're 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 heavy duty. They're built to last, and uh, uh, you know they're they're a bit they're a bit pricey. So um, it, it, you know if you can figure that out amongst a group, amongst a, a communal studio, or or uh, uh, certainly a school, but other other things, um, I think that's the way to go. Yeah, I wanted to go back to this idea of waste and, and think about it not in terms of the cardboard waste of shipping, but the waste that we actually generate in the studio. And one of those things is glaze. You know, like we often will do a lot of glaze testing, and then if the tests don't turn into something that we want, then we have this leftover material. And the same goes with clay. You know, like when we're, whatever our process is, there's often leftover clay that is not, if we're not recycling it, then we have to figure out what to do with it. So can can you all talk about what you find to be the best practices for either reclaiming or doing something with the actual ceramic waste in the studio? I think there's a lot of options. So that makes me think of like years ago as at watershed um, volunteering, like as one of their like summer cleanup crew people. And they had like so much like waste glaze and we had to figure out a way to like get rid of it. And it was just like buckets and buckets and buckets. So basically what we did is um, we, um, we made crucibles and then fired them within that. But then um, from there, you can think about it like, well, that's another material that you can use from there. So um, I really just think that the possibilities of using waste glaze, for example, is like limitless. Um, That can be turned into pavers for your driveway or or walkway. It can be used for, I don't know, murals or it can just totally be repurposed. It just turns into like a, a solid material from there. I think the most common use is for to make pavers, uh, to to make the uh, glaze and clays inert and and stop it from going into our wastewater systems and so on. So uh, you know, I, I highlighted a, a woman from the West Coast named Kristen Schimmick uh, in my book that that makes these pavers. They're very they're they're made all over the place, and you can combine your your waste clay products. Uh, and your waste glaze materials together and uh, just mix them together and throw them into a mold and, and make your own pavers that, that'll pave your uh, patio or backyard or, or studio area. Um, and, and, but there's all sorts of ways to, to work with it and uh, all, the, all those ways of doing things. I recently interviewed Caroline Chang, who is an artist based in well, she's based a lot of places, but she has a factory in Jingdezhen that's taking recycled fired ceramic material 
and using that waste to then become architectural uh, tile or other types of things. And we're actually going to put out her interview at the same time or at, around the same time as this one. And it just brings up an interesting topic is that what do we do with the fired objects that we don't necessarily like? <laughs> right. I agree. And again, in my book, I highlighted a friend of mine, Dave Binns, uh, from Wales in the UK. And he's done, you know, he experimented with this for his own aesthetic, for crushing up uh, waste material and combining it and, re and firing it into uh, sort of architecturally based product. But then that it took off. And now, you know, in, in his country, in, in Wales, uh, he's received all kinds of, he actually started a company to manufacture these panels for uh, architecture. And of course, because they're sustainable and they're a green product, they're, you know, they've had rave reviews and they're getting funded and, and people are just really buying into it. So, uh, you know, there are all kinds of ways and, and examples all over the world of people doing this. And that's a good thing. I mean, that even makes me think of like in traveling. Um, so like going to like Jingzhen, China and even like some like the smaller like hilltop villages in Italy, um, some of like their city walls are built with like these cast off like, oh, hey, like these are our seconds. And they use that to incorporate into like the actual architecture and use that as like um, a way to fill up space and use less cement and other materials. Exactly right, Danielle. Exactly right. I remember Richard Notkin uh, going to uh, China and taking photos and sharing them with me of, of exactly that thing. I think that's been done, uh, you know, from from the beginning uh, when people had waste ceramic product and, and in certain parts of the world, they just learned how to use it uh, locally uh, and incorporate it into their environment. And it's, it's a fantastic thing. I personally have been making using shards and working with industry uh, in my own work, uh, sculptural work. Uh, for for many many years, and I just think it's a great way to extend the material once it's fired, and and turn it into something else, turn it into art. In, in my case, I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually thinking the same thing. <laughs> so I want to <laughs> transition to talking about your guys' individual and collective art careers. Um, Robert, you you mentioned that you've used things from industry as a part of the work, and um, we did a whole interview about the work that you did when you were a resident at the Archie Bray using bricks and tile uh, sewer. I guess that's still called sewer pipe. I guess it could be. Yeah, that's one name. <laughs> yeah, to to build these uh, sculptures from that. So can you can you guys talk about your aesthetic interest in um, ceramics that have sort of one use, but then you repurpose them or upcycle them into something else. Well, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about that because, uh, you know, my, my interest in, in that sort of activity, repurposing, recycling, reusing, uh, grew out of necessity in a way. I was interested in making large scale, larger scale work. And I just, it just was the perfect uh, sort of scenario for me. I, I was a resident of the Bray. The Bray was at that moment purchased the old brick factory and all this old material came uh, available. So uh, in my case, just being in the right place at the right time was really uh, what sparked that and gave me, I think, built the confidence in myself to uh, work on on these larger scale uh, uh, pieces, but um, you know it's it's everywhere. It's, I, when I talk to students or when I talk to anybody that's emerging in the field, uh, I encourage them to just look in their backyard, look at look look in your grandma's backyard, look wherever. There's always a pile of something that that can be utilized and and repurposed and made into something else. And I I, I think we just need to keep our eyes open. That's my perspective. Yeah, I agree. Um, I even talk with my students that I work with about how do we recycle and how do we bring different things in from within arm's reach? Like, what do you have in your studio that's just been kicking around or what can you reuse and what would that look like? Um, so like within my own work, um, I just, I don't know. I think of like reusing as like all these like layers that just really add on to one another. So like 
um, the ceramic work I make, typically it's usually like just once fired, brought up to temperature, um, and finished with like a cold surface. Um, cold surfaces can be anything from like charcoal that I took out of my wood stove, um, and turn into a dye or rust that I use vinegar to take off of like objects that I find out and about just in my daily routines, um, turn that into a dye or, um, I also make paper out of upcycled clothing, um, rope out of bedding, just kind of anything can be reused really. And then it's fun too, because once you kind of open that door for yourself too, all of those things that you've already made, they become like a library that you get to go back to and kind of, well, how can you reuse these objects? So like I work a lot with installation, um, just like Robert does and all the objects that I have, like they're for one installation, but then oftentimes they'll get absorbed and reused into another installation. Um, so it's also like a really fun way to like, just approach making. Yeah. All those layers. I couldn't agree more, Danielle. I think it, 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 it gives the, your older work new life. And, you know, I've heard from many people over the years as I've been sort of repurposing my own work into newer pieces that they, they love that idea of sort of getting a, a bigger bang for the buck in a way they're getting a new piece, but it has uh, parts of, of older work in it uh, as well. And uh, I think, again, going back to, you know, uh, the cost factors of all these uh, of, of our, our uh, studio practice, I mean, it's, it's a great way to, uh, to incorporate uh, things at a fraction of the cost because they've already been made and uh, become something else. I even find like, I really don't step into like art stores or order art supplies. Even um, I find like local thrift stores are kind of like their own, like little art shop, like, especially once you open that door and like being receptive to like just reusing and repurposing. I think once you start seeing objects as potential art, it, it does change your mind. Cause I, I know when I walk into antique stores, it's kind of the same thing where I'm I'm looking and going, oh, look at that teapot shape like that. And, and in my case, I'm not necessarily buying the object and then using it in a sculpture, but I'm thinking like, oh, this is all fair game in terms of the, the formal qualities. So I think it's exciting to think about that you're making paper from clothes, you're making, uh, I think you said rope from bedding, like you're making all of these things that can then become tools for more art in the future. Totally agree. It's uh, it, it, like Danielle said, once you give yourself the permission to, to work or look at, in, at work or at, at work that's previously made in a different way uh, and, and as potential for something else, it just opens that door and, and it's liberating. It's totally liberating. You know, you, you really uh, you're still looking, you're still perceiving, you're still uh, thinking about things like you said, Ben shapes and other things, but it's just a, a whole nother way of, uh, of, of, of uh, art making, I think. So I wanted to plug the exhibition that you guys have collaborated on. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you decided to collaborate together and then where that exhibition is and how people can see it? Gosh, I think it was like about a year ago, maybe a little bit more now. Robert and I. So I had just graduated. Um, I moved to the place where I'm at now and Robert and I are neighbors. Um, I knew that he, you know, was a very prolific artist. Um, we had very like close artist statements, concepts, um, things that we were like pushing within our work, um, environmental awareness and concepts, sustainability. So I thought it would be really interesting to, um, see what that would lead to two people that um even though like our work is so like tied together in like environmental sustainability and reusing and repurposing um our individualistic work is definitely different from one another so i just thought that would be like a really lovely thing to do as neighbors especially like spend some time together 
get to know one another, have conversations about our work and life and everything in between and just kind of see where our artworks, like what, what does that look like? Yeah. So I was just curious about that. It, 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 it was a great day when, when Danielle uh, talked to me about a possibility of collaboration and I just thought, wow, that's fantastic. You know, it's a, a, a younger artist uh, emerging into the, into the field uh, working in a way I don't typically work necessarily with, with the way Danielle works and applies materials. And I thought, well, I can learn a lot from her. And I think she felt the same in terms of the kind of work I've done in the past and reclaimed work and also uh, the scale I work in uh, often. So it was just, uh, you know, a wonderful opportunity. And we, we just uh, started talking and started thinking and started experimenting uh, slowly, and it, it was about a one-year-long uh, uh, process to end up with with an installation for a gallery here in Helena, Montana. And it's at the Myrna Loy Center for the Arts, which has a, a gallery within it. It's in downtown Helena, Montana, and it uh, the Jailhouse Gallery, as I called, because it's in a historic building that was once the county jail, uh, is is hosting this. Uh, uh, installation and uh it's a it's fun it's really fun it's dynamic it's bright it's colorful it there are things hanging from the ceiling there's a, a big arch in the center of it but i learned so much again from danielle about about her wor- way of working that just uh again turned me on and, and got me excited about uh, uh working in a different way and that's part of my goal i think as i've uh matured in my work and and you know, I'm always looking for inventive or, or different ways of working. And uh, uh, I think we're well suited to one another in terms of our temperament and our interests. And uh, it was a, it was just a fun project all the way along. And it's up now. Uh, it installed a couple of weeks ago and it's up through mid-March uh, at the Myrna Loy Center. So uh, we're thrilled. We had a nice article appear in the local paper. We're uh, we have images of it now that we're sharing with people. And uh, and I, I also wanted to take a minute and mention the fact that the NC Green Task Force is having an exhibition at the Cincinnati Conference in the Convention Center. There'll be about 15 to 20 artists represented in this exhibition from within the task force that are uh, working in, uh, in a sustainable way. So we, each of us will have between one and three pieces, some installations, some, it's a pretty large space and some smaller works on pedestals, but, uh, but we're, we're going to have this, this really our first ever exhibition of, of sustainable, uh, ceramic work, uh, at, at this year's conference. Yeah, that's wonderful. What, where, what's the location for that in Sika show? Uh, I can't be specific in terms of the room number, but it's in the convention center. And if you come, uh, Green Task Force booth will have a nice poster uh, or, or some information on how to find it. But it's it's basically just a, a short hop, skip, and jump from uh, the the exhibitors area in the in the convention center to the the gallery. There's a you know num- over the years there's uh, there's other e- exhibitions that happen within the convention center. So it's a it's a good sized room. Uh, I think it's if I'm not mistaken, three thousand square feet or Two, two or three thousand. It's a big space, and uh, and we're we're bringing or shipping. I don't think so many shipping, but we're bringing work and installing at the conference. It's it's really exciting. So to wrap up, could you guys leave contact information, either social media or website, um, so that people could get in touch with you if they wanted to talk about any of the ideas you mentioned today? I primarily use Instagram, and mine's O'Malley underscore Art. And then, yeah, I can also be reached through my website, um, and that is omalleyart.net. Um, and I have, like, a contact spot there. And then I wouldn't mind plugging our Ensika website just one last time, too. And that's just um, ensikagtf.com. Uh, and mine, uh, my Instagram uh, is at Robert Harrison 2976 uh, I use, probably use more Facebook uh, 
than than uh, Instagram, but I'm on on Facebook, just Robert Harrison, and um, uh, I have a website. It's uh, all one word, Robert Harrison. Dot co. So uh, the, any of those ways you you can reach me, and when I think both Danielle and I are happy to uh, and welcome uh, contacts or questions uh, about these issues. Well, I appreciate you both doing this today. I appreciate the time and also the energy put towards sustainability. Thanks for having us, Beth. Thank you, Ben. It's a great opportunity, and uh, we 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 applaud your efforts in all of this and uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'd like to thank Robert and Danielle for taking the time to do this interview. I certainly appreciate them and the work that the Green Task Force does. If you're interested in getting involved with sustainability and environmental stewardship, the task force is a great way to do that. If you're going to be at this year's Nsika conference, you can check out their booth. You can also come to the taping I mentioned in the intro, and you'll be able to meet some of the members there as well. Before we go, I'd like to thank today's sponsors. That's Amico Brent, the Archie Bray Foundation, and the Rosenfield Collection of Functional Ceramic Art. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor on the show, you can get in touch through our website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, Or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.